Thank you. I am also joined by my co-presenter, Boo. Uh, um, she travels with me everywhere. So yeah, my name is Holden. My preferred pronouns are she or her. It's tattooed on my wrist in case you or I forget. Um, mornings can be a little rough sometimes. Uh, I'm a developer advocate at Google. Um, it's nice, they pay me money, and I work on open source software. It keeps me happy. Um, and I'm on the Spark PMC, and I contribute to Beam and a lot of other uh, Apache projects as well. Um, previously, I was at uh, IBM, Alpine, Databricks, Google, Foursquare and Amazon. I'm a co-author of two books. Um, the second one, I realized that you can negotiate royalties um, with publishers. So if you're looking to buy a book about Spark and you don't really care what's inside, definitely buy the second one. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter. And if you happen to be curious about like how ASF code reviews go in really large projects, um, I'm live streaming some code reviews as well. Um, I don't know, I think it's fun, and then I actually set aside time to do code reviews, which is always a challenge when you're busy. Um, in addition to who I am professionally, I'm trans, queer, Canadian, and part of the leather community. This isn't super important or directly related to deep learning, um, but I think especially for those of us who are gonna be working on machine learning related problems, it's important to remember that uh, we all come from a variety of backgrounds and we should work together to make sure that we build systems that work for everyone and we don't just build crap that reinforces our existing um, crappy systems and we can make more awesome things. Uh, that being said, I give you no techniques to do that, um, so good luck. Uh, okay, yeah, this is Boo. She also uses she, her pronouns, um, and she is the author of Learning to Bark and High Performance Barking. You can also follow her on Twitter. Uh, she does not currently have a Twitch, but maybe, maybe one day soon. Um, and why does my employer care? Um, and this is in response to something that uh, I was asked this morning by someone who was like, so I get that you work on open source, but why does Google care about these systems? Don't they have like awesome other internal systems? Um, and yeah, we have a lot of really awesome internal code, but we also think it's really important to support all of the wonderful tools in the big data ecosystem. Um, things like Apache Beam and Apache Spark we have on Google Cloud with hosted solutions. Um, and even if it's not a thing where we have a so hosted solution, uh, it's fun because you can just run it on Google Cloud and then we make money. Um, or at least that's something along the lines of what I vaguely understood from our business plan, the like five minutes of it that I like was paying attention and then I walked out because it was getting kind of confusing. Um, and so that's not official, but just TLDR, somehow this results in money for my employer. Don't worry about me. I will continue to get paid. Um, okay, so hopefully you're nice people. Um, I am really curious, how many people here are Spark users? Okay, how many people are Flink users? Because I'm in Berlin. That is less than I was expecting. Maybe there is another Flink talk happening at the same time. Okay, how many people are Beam users? That is about what I expected. Um, that, that was three. Um, but it's cool. Beam is, Beam is awesome, and it's going to get more awesome. Um, so I'm going to talk about big data outside of the JVM in general, um, because TensorFlow is sort of, we can just think of it as a special use case of um, trying to do big data outside of the JVM. And then we'll look at TensorFlow on Spark, and then we'll also look at TensorFlow on Beam. And we'll talk about how Apache Arrow can totally change these things to no longer resemble a f did you have the Ford Pinto here? Is that, no, okay. It's an American car that was notable for catching on fire. Um, and so we'll make this better than our V1 product, which currently catches on fire. Okay, so PySpark, actually how many people are PySpark users in the house? Not that many. So I apologize to all of you PySpark users. Um, it's getting better. but. PySpark is the Python interface to Spark. It's the general technique used for a lot of other language on, on top of Spark. And it's also the same thing that is used to power TensorFlow on Spark. We um, pretty much looked at the possibility of writing our own bindings and went, that's hard. Oh, but we already know how to talk to Python. Yay! Um, and the performance is bad. But that's, that's OK. So why is the performance bad for all of these things? Uh, we use this thing called pickling. Um, which is about as performant as that pickle, um, which is not very fast. Sockets 
to communicate data. And then because that wasn't enough, we decided we'd also use Unix pipes. Um, and then over top of that, we were like, you know what this really needs is another format for interchange. So we threw JSON on top of that. Um, yeah, that didn't go so well. Um, and it looks kind of like this. Um, we essentially end up copying our Lambda expressions from Python into the JVM. And then on the workers, we end up receiving these Lambda expressions and our data. And we take the both the data and the Lambda expressions and send them through to Python. Um, and even if you're going to work in Scala um, and you're going to use TensorFlow, oh, they told me not to move, eh, whatever. Um, you're going to miss, like, this part's going to go away, so Pi4j will not be in your life, and you'll be happy about that. But this part is still going to be in your life. And I'm really sorry, camera person. I just um, don't have a pointer thing. Uh, yeah, and in Flink, it's pretty much the same thing, uh, except uh, with slightly different formats. Um, so how does this impact uh, big data uh, systems besides Spark? Um, it makes double serialization costs make all of this very expensive and slow. Um, and that's fine. I'm a cloud provider. I sell you resources by the hour. Um, if it takes twice as long to run, I make twice as much money. I think. I'm not super sure on how our business model works, but that seems probable. Um, the only downside is it, it turns out that you might go like, wow, this is really slow. I'm just not going to do this. And then that's sad, because that's money that I'm not making. Um, and it might also be sad for you, because it's a problem that you're not solving. Um, there's a bunch of other things that are bad. The error messages make no sense, but if you're working with TensorFlow, you're already experiencing that. Um, and the dependency management makes limited amounts of sense. Um, and this is amazing, because we take a system that is designed to distribute Java packages, and then we make it distribute native code. And then that goes about as well as that sounds, which is poorly. Um, and so I want to be clear. Um, a lot of times when I talk about how PySpark and Flink work, people are like, wow, those both sound terrible. What should I use instead? And I'm here to tell you everything else sucks too. Uh, some of the systems even looked at that and went, you know what this needs? XML. Um, it did not need XML, but that's fine. Um, so don't worry, everything sucks. And this same general approach will apply to the other systems, even the ones that use XML. So OK, TensorFlow on Spark, let's, let's do the hello world part. Um, and we're going to train MNIST, yay. Um, and so there's, there's a TensorFlow on Spark package, which we can just use out of the box. We have to use it in Python, though. Um, but under the hood, it's Python calling Java, calling Python calling Java again, calling Python, calling C++ code. And so we get this like sort of turtles in the middle situation. It's not quite all the way down. Um, at the bottom, you always find C++ or Fortran there to give you a helping tand and a seg fault. Um, and so this, this works, surprisingly. Um, but you might not be very excited about this, because you're, you're probably Java users. So one of the things that we should do, uh, in addition to exposing this from Java, is make it not bad. Um, the performance of this is really terrible. Um, and there is some cool things which have happened, which now make it possible for us to make this performance really cool. Um, and this cat is very happy about this new performance paradigm. Um, and Apache Arrow will allow you to transfer data as fast as this cat is switching universes. Not a guarantee. Um, and, and the nice thing is it supports Spark uh, and GPUs and R and Python. Uh, it supports arbitrary Java libraries, so if you're not a Spark user, you could totally add support for this to whichever Java library that you're working in. Um, and actually, DL4j has support for Arrow, for example. Um, but you know, it's going to take a little bit of work if you want to, say, add it to Flink. Um, and so there's this really nice performance graph from someone which implies this will be 242 times faster. That's a lie. But it will be faster, probably. Um, and, and at least for, for our purposes, it will be. It, we're probably not even going to get the three times faster, but it does, it does make the stuff go a little better. Um, and so why, why we're talking about this? So we're talking about this because we're in Java, and we want to get our data into TensorFlow. Um, and we want to do that in a way which isn't incredibly slow. Um, and Apache Arrow is pretty much the only option right now for that. We could also write files out to disks in TF record, and that that's slow. Disks are not fast, um, even SSDs. Uh, and so instead, we can use Arrow as this fast interchange library. Um, and in the future, maybe we could go directly into TensorFlow rather than going Java, Arrow, Python, TensorFlow. But that would be work. 
Um, and other projects are using it too, right? All of our friends are jumping off of the cliff, so you should join us in this party. Um, that logic works. Uh, and so not just Spark. And so if you actually want to integrate other things um, besides TensorFlow, you should definitely check out Arrow and see if it fits your project. Um, and so to, to rewrite our code in Spark to use this, we essentially take our register function and we just call pandas UDF instead. And we can see here we're doing very advanced numeric computation. We're adding two integers together, which honestly, Java, a little touch and go, right? Numeric computation in Java. I don't know. And so the fact that we can add two integers together is a really good sign of how we're going to be able to power TensorFlow. And, and strangely enough, that's what we're going to do. Um, and so we can, we can do this to TF on Spark. The, the core of TF on Spark is this thing which takes for each partition and starts TensorFlow on each of the nodes and feeds it the data that it needs from your big data system. Um, and that's, that's cool. And that's kind of fast. Uh, it's a little unreliable, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about this. Um, and so we can make this train function, and we can rewrite it into this UDF, which returns zeros, because for, we forgot to add support for returning nulls. But that's OK. Um, this, this sad hack for now is probably the one part of the code which will survive, based on all of my experience. And this just ends up taking uh, our input data as an arrow um, thing, which is converted into pandas behind the scene, and then we convert it into tuples, and then we feed it to TensorFlow. And if that sounds like a lot of conversion, it is, but it, it, it's a bit faster. Um, and so this, this design looks like this. And so you can just go ahead and make this change in your own like private fork, and then um, your magic MNIST example. Ooh, all the way back here, will suddenly get faster. It will also get slightly less reliable, um, but that's a trade-off everyone's willing to make, right? Right? OK. Um, so the TLDR is the Spark scheduler has some issues when it comes to, to scheduling deep learning jobs um, in that we assume that we can just restart any individual partition. Ooh. And now the mood lighting takes effect as we move into, OK. Um, right, and so we, we swap pickles for arrow batch records. And now we have a little panda, which is much cuter than that circle. And that panda can go into TensorFlow, and that's fun. Yay, happy pandas. OK, so what could we do? Um, how can we make this like actually awesome? Uh, so the first thing that we could do is we could go back, look at this Lambda, where we're turning it into tuples and go, that sounds kind of unnecessary. Um, and that's totally a thing that we could get rid of. Um, but there are reasons why it doesn't work. Um, we could start using memory mapped arrow. So right now, we still put arrow records over top of Unix sockets. And so that was like a great plan. Um, memory mapped could be better. Uh, since we're not actually sending a lot of data back, though, who knows if this is going to make a big difference. Um, and the other one that we could do, which is really exciting, and we're looking at in Spark as well, is if we, sorry that I keep jumping back, um, we can see the arrow can read directly from Parquet. And one of the things we could do is if we know that we're running essentially just a TensorFlow job on raw Parquet data, we could just cut the JVM out, although that might not be so exciting for the people in here that like Java. Um, but for those of you who don't, we could get rid of Java. Um, and that's cool. OK, so that's all fun and good. Um, but you're here to access TensorFlow from the JVM. So now we have to create multi-language pipelines. Yay! Limited excitement. OK, no, so multi-language pipelines are amazing, because the alternative is that I learn how to rewrite TensorFlow in Java. And that does not sound like fun. I just want to use TensorFlow from Java. I don't want to have to make it. That is way too much work, and I am not paid by the hour anymore. Um, and so we actually have these uh, things, and we can kind of make them work in Spark. And in the future, we'll maybe be able to make them work in Beam. Um, and right now, in practice, it's really painful. But let's go look at the pain and see how we can do it. Yay. OK, so Sparkling ML is the project where I've done this. Um, you can go check it out. It's on GitHub, Sparkling Pandas. Um, and it supports 
other things besides TensorFlow. Turns out no one gives a shit about the other things besides TensorFlow. Um, if anyone's really into NLP, it does some cool NLP stuff, but um, come find me later, NLP friends. Uh, so, okay, how do we, how do we make this work? Um, we use our good friend Pi4j, and we make a Java class um, for representing the interface for what our Python code is going to be. Um, and we allow it to call into that with arbitrary parameters. And if you really want to look at startup.py, uh, you can definitely go look on the GitHub. Um, but this is the short version of it, is we put a bunch of functions in here, and then we say this is the class that we're implementing. Um, and then we allow Java to call us. Java will give us the Spark session information, um, the name of the function that it wants to call, and a bunch of parameters. And we'll just evaluate those parameters as an AST literal. <laughs> what could go wrong? Many things. Um, but provided that you have no malicious users ever, this is fine. If you have malicious users, this is an excellent way to execute arbitrary code. Uh, okay, so the, the Java boilerplate looks like pretty much the, the inverse of this. Um, it's also pretty boring, and it's the, the full details are in a few files. But now we can use it for NLP. I, I promise we'll use it for TensorFlow shortly, but the NLP example is funner and simpler. Um, so the first thing that we do, how many people are familiar with Spacey? Yay, four people. Um, this example is going to be great for them. For the rest of you, uh, oh wait, I'm in Europe. You, you experience languages, oh, and I'm in Germany. You experience languages where space tokenization is perhaps not ideal. Yes, sometimes. And so perhaps using the standard word count example that we all see, you get a bad count of the words. And so this is exciting. We can rewrite our word count example to use Spacey to get really effective tokenization. Um, and we all know this is big data, so word count is our use case. Um, so we, we take in an input series, and this is Essentially, we can take in pandas data frames, or we can take in series when we don't have structured data. And because I'm just getting a list of strings, we're just going to take in a series. Um, spaceymagic.get is essentially a whole bunch of shit which you really don't want to look at um, that just initializes spacey on the workers and makes sure everything is happy. Um, and it allows for reuse if you end up tokenizing a lot of data. And then inside, we call our happy little function um, and because I did this in Python 2.7, because reasons, um, we, or did I do it in Python 3? Whatever. I did it in something, and it was painful, so I have to explicitly call Unicode. I, remembering which virtual env I have active when I'm like writing code for a slide is hard. But this is, this is pretty cool, and we can tokenize our text, and it'll go fast. And on the JVM side, we, we just call it like a regular Spark ML pipeline stage. We specify our input columns and our output columns um, and our language, which is English, because it turns out that I don't speak any other languages besides English. So I assure you, this probably works better for German, but to be fair, I don't know. But it probably does, and that's good enough. OK, and so here's, here's this very fancy diagram we can see. Ooh. OK. Seems like people are really excited about the TensorFlow stuff and not so much NLP. That's fine. So Spark deep learning pipelines are yet another way to do deep learning on top of Spark. And um, they have some limitations that you can read about if you're particularly interested in them. But we can expose the Spark deep learning package um, from Python into Scala in pretty much the same way how we do uh, with everything else in Sparkling ML. Um, and so. We have to write this kind of not so pretty bit, um, because the, the first function that we were looking at back here is a really simple function. It, it takes in one column. You know, it's totally fine. I can write that as a UDF really simply. But not everything can be directly defined as a UDF. Some things actually need to take in a data frame. And this is especially true for deep learning things, um, where we want to look at a bunch of things on the data frame at the same time. So we take in a data frame. We make all kinds of happiness. Um, the Scala side looks pretty similar. Uh, the model name, yay. Ooh, OK. Everyone's very excited by the Scala boilerplate code. 
very ex no okay the front row is just like no i don't care um okay and so this is this is this this is the part with the actual sadness where we take our our scala parameters and we serialize them as strings to give to python this is bad but it's not that bad and Okay, yeah. And so, whatever. You can just, if there's more parameters that you want to access in the model, you can just add it here and uh, do that because I got lazy and I added the minimum number of parameters required for this to work. Um, but you can come and add the parameters that you care about so you can access them and set them on your model and have happy fun times. So you can, instead of set model name, you can have other functions there too. And in a magical possible future, um, our data will not have to flow through Python first. Um, that magical possible future requires a lot more code than exists today, though. So this magical possible future is like definitely a patches welcome scenario. Um, so let's not focus on that. OK, cool. So that is how to make shit work with uh, Spark and the various Python-based systems and exposing the Python systems into the JVM. But there are other ways to do this, too. We could use DL4J. Um, it also uses Arrow, probably. I'm like 50% sure from reading their code. Um, it looks like they do, but the DL4J code is kind of gnarly, so I'm not 100% sure where they use it. Um, this leads us really well into our next point. You, you might find yourself trying to train a deep learning model and then finding yourself needing to do this thing called feature prep. How many people spend their time doing feature prep? There are less hands than I expected. How many, time, how many people spend their time doing really cool ML shit that is not feature prep? There is two hands. Interesting. Interesting. I want to talk to you about your jobs later. Um, but so there's a really good chance that the people who didn't raise their hand just aren't using this yet. And it turns out that as, as cool as this DL4J and all of these fun systems are, um, our data has to be in a format that we can do our cool deep learning on it. Um, and so we've got two different options. And probably there are more that I just don't remember. Um, there are pre-built packages that are designed to allow us to do our um, feature prep in a way that it can be reused at run to, at serving time. Um, and another option is we could just write piles of custom code, and then we could just keep it in sync by hand from training time to serving time, and it definitely wouldn't get out of sync and start returning the wrong results. And there's one person who finds that very amusing. I want to know what results you were predicting. Anyways, so another possible future is we could use Apache Beam. And those three people in the audience would be very excited. Um, and we could use TFX on top of Beam on top of Spark, or TFX on top of Beam on top of Flink. Um, and then, yay, happiness. Um, and so if we did that, we could get access to things like TF Transform. Um, and this allows us to represent all of our like kind of gnarly feature prep stuff and have it automatically compiled in for serving into our graph. Um, it's really fun. It runs on top of Apache Beam, and it currently doesn't work uh, outside of Google Cloud Platform. Um, if you're a Google customer, it's great, and that's lovely. But I, uh, I also want other people to, to be able to use it. And we're working on it. But if you go home and try and use this today, you will be sad. Um, but that being said, let's look at the code. Um, and so, yeah, we can scale to 0, 1, strings to ants, all of the common sort of feature prep stuff. Um, and for example, like scaling to 0 to 1 or computing the mean, I mean, that requires that we actually see all of the data first, right? I, I can't um, just do this with like a hash function and hope for the best. Um, and so TF transform runs this sort of analyze pass on our data, and it outputs pure um, TensorFlow constant tensors that can then be used in your same serving graph. And then you can use the fun, happy you know, TensorFlow serving ecosystem. Um, and there's a whole bunch of things in there for pretty much any use case that you want. Um, and so let's let's focus on the limitations of this. Um, so non-JVM Beam does not work so well outside of Google and its environment. So if you want to make something in production today, you're kind of stuck with one of the other things that we've been talking about, or becoming a Google Cloud customer, which is great. Um, you could uh, we use gRPC and Protobuf instead of Arrow. Um, performance is more or less equivalent. It's just uh, 
not invented here syndrome, I guess, would be the not so polite description. Um, but it predates Arrow as well. Um, and there's exciting new work. Um, if there are Python 3 users in the audience, we don't support Python 3. I'm really sorry. You can come join me. There is a uh, sort of tracking Jira uh, where we have lots of fun things. Um, it kind of, there's a hacked up prototype that you can look at. Um, and you can even run Go on top of it. Um, the Go part is completely unrelated to TensorFlow, but kind of fun. Um, except in that it, it allows us to run native code, and therefore we could theoretically run TensorFlow stuff on top of it that way, too. Um, are there any Go users? Ooh, come talk to me um, about running Go on big data with Beam, if you're so inclined. Um, and you can run it on top of uh, Google Cloud today, or sort of Apache Flink, kind of. Very much kind of. And in the future, maybe also Spark, which would be really convenient, because I don't want to have to learn a lot about Flink. I'm pretty lazy. And uh, as a San Francisco kid, you know, I, I learned Spark first. Uh, so yeah, OK, cool. So how does, how does this stuff relate uh, to TensorFlow? So TensorFlow is in Python, kind of. And if we support multi-language pipelines in Beam, we can do the same tricks that we did inside of Spark um, to make this stuff work. And then we can actually be portable. And we can use cool libraries like TF Transform so we don't have to write like giant piles of custom code and write custom model exporting code. Um, it doesn't work today or tomorrow, but eventually. Um, here's a whole bunch of resources. If anyone's interested in like playing with these things, um, Sparkling ML is not production ready either. It's like a project that I work on with some friends who occasionally show up. But uh, it probably works. And if it doesn't, you could fix it. Um, and I mean, it passes its test suite, which is pretty promising too. Uh, we're going to get to my most important slide, which is high performance Spark. It is completely unrelated to this talk, but I do get the highest royalties on it. So I strongly encourage those of you with a corporate expense account to purchase this book and not return it. Um, cats love it, and if you buy the printed copy, um, your cat will love the book. Although, definitely buy the ebook copy as well, because I get double royalties on the ebook. <coughs> OK. Um, I will be talking about dealing with contributor overload uh, later on this week. Um, if you want an excuse to go to New York, I'll be there later on this month. And you can come join me at any of these other fun events. Um, and otherwise, I think happy question time if people have questions. Or, OK. <laughs> I, I know he has a question. Are you not going to ask me that question? I, it's up to you. Can I? Perfect. Hi. So you were talking a lot about all this transformation and all this software and so on. But what about the last resort in terms of performance? Since here we need to go from this platform to this framework and so on, what about my last result? I mean, I mean is it going to take more time to actually get what I want? or? Yeah, I mean, every time we copy data is expensive. Um, that being said, uh, so the th theory, ooh, let's go all the way back. Magic slide, magic slide. Come on. Ooh, there's a lot of slides. OK, yeah, the theory with, with Apache Arrow is that um, while we'll be jumping between all of these systems, if our data remains in the same format, um, it's not so expensive. For today, right now, we still end up copying that from the memory of these different systems. Uh, but we could use shared memory buffers. It's just that every attempt of that so far has mostly resulted in um, a lot of exceptions um, and a few seg faults. Uh, but th it's not inherently not going to work as a shared memory buffer. And once it starts being passed around as a shared memory buffer, the cost of switching between these systems will get a lot less expensive. Does that answer your question? Yay! The present is bad. The future is better. Maybe. Not a guarantee. Oh, yay. OK, I had a question about your uh, multi-language support as well as the multiple backend runners for Beam. So you have Python, Go, Java, and God knows what, what's coming next. And you have Flink, Spark, Apex, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. 
and uh, so the different permutations on the combinations, so Spa, uh, Python SDK with Flink Runner and the Go SDK with Spark Runner. How do you regression test all of these in a release? It kind of seems like pain. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> so next question. Uh, I, I mean, it's it's really slow and annoying to test a whole bunch of different things, but yeah. it's okay. Uh, cloud computers, magic. We can just run a whole bunch of computers and test the matrix. Um, so the next the next question is about the Beam and the Flink runner. So it, I'd seen that it takes a hell of a lot of time to just start up the workflow and you know for the pipeline to start executing. Yeah, uh, I know it's experimental. It's a so what is happening in between that it's taking like five to six minutes just to load up on my laptop for the pipeline to start up on my laptop? That's a great question. Yeah. Um, so it does a whole bunch of things. Um, it starts a bunch of containers, yeah. which takes just a, a little bit of time. Um, and then once it started the containers, it also starts Flink, waits for Flink to finish starting, and then starts some more containers um, and waits for those containers to finish starting as well. And so pretty much it's just booting a whole bunch of like mini VMs and, uh, oh, and the other part is um, there, there was like a race condition and so uh, we fixed that in the traditional way, okay. <coughs> which is just waiting a long time and hoping it doesn't happen. So yeah, my question was more with the Python SDK and the ping fling Python SDK runner. Oh yeah. yeah. So we for for the for the Python SDK though, like we start a different container with extra happy things inside of it. Oh yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. Um, and the extra happy things take a while to start because uh, we so with the with the Java Direct Runner right now, um, it's not actually starting a whole bunch of different containers and doing the RPCs over them. It's just like I'm in Java. I'm awesome. Um, and so the overhead's a lot lower to start a new pipeline uh, for now. Uh, the last question, sorry. Uh -huh. So uh, let's say if I have a beam with a Flink runner, and uh, in Flink, if I were just writing my job in Flink, I can parallelize each operator, and uh, you know the number of uh, parallel, I can set the parallelism for each operator. I kind of s find that missing in Beam, and you know trying to translate that from Beam to Flink. Uh, how does that all work? Or is it still working? Or... Sorry. Yeah, OK, so that's that's not super well exposed in the API. Um, uh, yeah, I think that is an area of active work would be the, um, but it's not like people aren't aware of this sort of like um, challenge with the, the decreased knowledge of what's happening inside the box. And it's trying to find ways to expose enough information about the, the runners without making it so that this pipeline that you've written, which is in theory like portable across all of these different runners, becomes locked into that one runner, right? We don't want that to happen. And so it's, it's uh, complicated to do well, so it takes time. Cool. Are there any non-Beam questions? Yes. <laughs> um, I have a question. Um, do any of these um, uh, problems that you presented go away if uh, we don't need to train any models with TensorFlow, but just want to use a model and just just use it for making predictions? I mean, if you just want to serve your TensorFlow models, do you want to serve your TensorFlow models with like big data, in, or do you want to just serve it streaming? Um, streaming. Oh yeah, I but mean the first. Uh, just is don't touch the JVM. Just like forget all of this shit and just use like the happy TF serving libraries. Oh, we have some legacy code also. Oh. <laughs> well then, <laughs> that depends on your legacy code. Um, I guess is the short answer. I would have to take a look at it, and I really don't want to. <laughs> Any other question? In that case, thank you again. Mm -hmm.